A listener note. This story contains adult content and language. If you're listening to this podcast, you might want to go back and start at episode one. This is a story being told in chronological order. Therefore, you might miss some details or context that are pretty important to the story. From Exclave Media, this is The Sicario Effect. I'm Jonathan Branstein. Se busca a Pablo Escobar. Recompensa 2700. Con John Jairo Velázquez Vázquez. ¿Usted por qué se entrega de nuevo a la justicia? Porque no le debo nada a la justicia. A Colombian hired killer known as Popeye has been released from prison. Hola, guerreras y guerreros. Yo soy su amigo John Jairo Velázquez Vázquez, conocido como Popeye. Alias Popeye, mi señor. Yo soy John Jairo Velázquez Vázquez Popeye. Hola, guerreras y guerreras. Episode 2. DNA. I'm going to Medellín. I'm going to interview a guy who is uh, somewhat controversial. John Jairo Velasquez Vasquez, alias Popeye. I really hate that fucking guy. Clearly, Popeye's social media fame and celebrity didn't sit well with Esteban. We spoke further. A few days later, he told me, I don't know why, but I had a feeling you were going to say Popeye. <laughs> really, I said? Yeah, I just had this feeling, but I get it. He's big on YouTube, whatever. I think you'll understand better when you come back. That night, I thought a lot about our conversation. Again, I wasn't naive and thought that everyone in Colombia just loved Popeye. The man killed a lot of people. Yet in a bizarre twist, he's become somewhat of a celebrity. Not just in Colombia, but all over the world. To date, his YouTube page has over 600,000 subscribers. Over the next three days, I had multiple phone conversations with Esteban. Despite his initial reaction, he kindly reached out on my behalf to several friends and acquaintances in Medellin. By the next day, I was in contact with Alejandro Quiseño. I had no idea how he would feel about interpreting Pablo Escobar's former Sicario. We got on the phone. His English was good. Very good. He understood everything I was saying. The conversation didn't skip a beat. Finally, after about mm, six or seven minutes of perfunctory small talk, I felt I had to clue him in on what we would be doing. So, I'm interviewing a man who's controversial. John Jairo Velasquez Vasquez. Silence on the end of the line. Hello, Alejandro, hello? Yeah, Jonathan, Popeye. Indeed, quite controversial. Look, Jonathan, narcos are a complicated thing here. It's not all black and white. There's a gray area. There's a lot of layers to Colombia. We spoke for quite a while longer. Towards the end of the conversation, Alejandra had a suggestion. If you're coming to Colombia, I think it would be helpful to talk to some other people, in addition to Popeye. It's up to you, but if you're open to it, I'm happy to help you find someone. Looking back, I was grateful for his suggestion. Do you have anyone in mind, I replied. Let me give it some thought. I have a friend who is a journalism professor here. He might be able to help. We'll talk further once you're in Medellin. The call ended. I still had a pit in my stomach. This project was far from the simple conversation I was originally planning. Saturday, November 11th, 2017. I took an early morning flight from Los Angeles with a connection in Miami. It's a three hour and 35 minute flight from Miami International to Medellin. The route is almost directly south of Miami flying over Cuba, Jamaica, and a long stretch of the Caribbean Sea until the descent, which begins at the coast just over Cartagena, heading directly for the interior of Colombia to the higher elevations of Antioquia. It's 9 p.m. by the time we land in a thick blanket of fog. Jose Maria Cordova International Airport is located in the municipality of Rio Negro, which coincidentally also happens to be the birthplace of Pablo Escobar. I quickly pass through customs, change some dollars, and grab a cab. The late model Chevrolet sail makes its way onto the Las Palmas thoroughfare towards the city. The ride is a spiraling descent into the Abura Valley. Unfortunately, the visibility is almost none. After about 45 minutes, we arrive at my hotel in the El Poblado district of Medellin. Since the fog was quite thick that night, I still had no idea what to make of Medellin. During the night, the fog lifted, and I awoke to clear skies in all directions. I'm immediately struck by two things, the buildings and the mountains. There are a lot of them. Medellin is a big city, really big. Clusters of huge skyscrapers spread throughout the valley from all ends. I can't get over how many high-rises there are. 
It feels like Manhattan in the mountains. The poorer neighborhoods, or communas as they are called, are situated on the borders of the city, with its shanty dwellings blanketing the base of the surrounding mountains and spreading all the way up into the higher elevations. They look similar to the favelas of Rio. To the southeast of the city lies the suburb of Envigado, where Pablo Escobar grew up. Sunday evening, Medellin. Alejandro and I agreed to meet for dinner to go over the game plan for Popeye. Since I had a little time to kill before, I set out for my hotel on foot. The neighborhood of El Poblado is located in the southeastern part of Medellin, situated at the base of the mountains of the Abura Valley. It's a somewhat swanky neighborhood, lined with trendy restaurants, cafes, and stores. After several minutes, I reach the lower flats and turn left onto Avenida Poblado, a broad, multi-lane boulevard running east-west. Coming into view, Staples, Starbucks, and of course McDonald's are just a few of the recognizable brands that have planted their flags here. Giant office buildings, hotels, and malls occupy both sides of the street. Looking around, if you didn't know where you were, you could be in any nondescript city in North America. I arrive at the Oviedo Center Mall. It's the oldest mall in El Poblado, complete with familiar stores like Swatch and Adidas. Even though it's more than a month away, Christmas decorations are being put up and holiday music played on loudspeakers. After figuring out the maze of escalators, I find the restaurant, El Corral Gourmet, a burger joint. Alejandro is already seated. I recognize him immediately. A handsome paisa in his mid-thirties, he looks just like his photo on Facebook. Dressed casually in t-shirt and jeans, he greets me with an eager smile. We shake hands and sit down. He speaks with a caring but serious demeanor. We order our food. We go over a few technical details for the interview. With talk of scheduling and logistics out of the way, the conversation turned toward Popeye. Alejandro didn't denounce him or endorse him. It was as if he wanted me to make up my own mind rather than influence me. Between narco-terrorism, FARC guerrilla activities, and political instability, almost everyone in Colombia has been exposed to violence and terrorism. Alejandro shared some of his own experience. I mean, when I was growing up, we had... One of my neighbors was kidnapped, for example. I mean, she was 14 years old. She was returned like after three months after the family paid. Uh, this is a whole other dimension to this that I don't understand. I don't, I don't know, like in other countries, if something horrible happens, everyone reacts to that. And they even, I mean, they, there are public demonstrations of, of people. Here, that doesn't happen here. I mean, you get in the news from time to time, like, I don't know, five, ten, six uh, people killed in the countryside in one night. What? I mean, this And nobody is... says anything. Here we are sitting in a nice ra- nice restaurant and, a, and a, you know, look at the shops, there's everything, people are civilized. And it feels very much normal to me. It feels like... like... Do you remember, Jonathan? Colombia is one of the countries in, in the Western Hemisphere with the highest inequality. And Medellin is the city. The highest in inequality? inequality. And Medellin is the city in Colombia with the highest inequality. Why? I don't you know, mean, because I like think a, it's. Of like, you mean to rich and poor? You're talking like class struggle, like uh, oligarch. Uh, Oligarchs, exactly. Uh, basically, Jonathan, uh, you know them, what the minimum wage in Colombia is? It's probably $260 a month. Like, even to, that's, to cover basics here is very difficult. Very, very difficult. And many people have to do with that. week. And many people have to do with that. So that's when, when you visit uh-huh. these poor, 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 poor neighborhoods and you see kids in the street going birth food, they have one meal a day, that's when you start understanding what the problem is. So because when you are in a in a nice place like this, in a in in, in, a, in a nice neighborhood, city. exactly, you don't get that. You don't think of that. You think, oh my God, Medellin is really really good, and it is a good city, but there is a big part of the picture that you have to see to believe. So it is Amazing. tough. Yes. Now it's been worse in the past. Yes. Colombia has made improvements in poverty. Yes. But it's still a bad situation. Essential information may sometimes come from unlikely couriers. Many see John Jairo Velasquez Vasquez as a demon. 
However, there are those who celebrate him as a survivor. I want to be clear about something. By extraordinary, I'm not saying he's cool or someone I admire, but simply referring to the fact that his experiences are truly unique. He's also one of the few former inner circle members of the Medellin cartel still alive. Mira, eh, mi niñez estuvo rodeada de violencia porque aquí se vio la, la violencia política desde los años 50. My childhood was surrounded by violence. In the 1950s, Colombia experienced political violence on a massive scale throughout the entire country. Today, that period is known as La Violencia. Colombia's history has never been free from violence. The second half of the 20th century was no exception. On April 9th, 1948, the leading presidential candidate, Jorge Eliser Gaitan, the head of the populist liberal party and clear threat to the ruling oligarchs, was assassinated. The killing of Gaitan ignited a civil war between conservative and liberal political parties. Eventually, the war would draw in all social classes and religious groups. It would last for over 12 years and take the lives of over 200,000 Colombians. The violence was out of hand. The judicial system and police had collapsed. Two million of its population fled to neighboring Venezuela. Many were removed from their homes forcibly. Historians have long tried to understand why it happened. Many are still searching for an answer. Author Mark Bowden described it as a nightmarish period of bloodletting, so empty of meaning, it is simply called La Violencia. Unfortunately, when the war ended, little was done to fix the systematic corruption rooted so deeply in all aspects of society. Little, if any attempts were made to reconcile warring groups or factions. It was, for lack of a better description, a giant sweeping under the rug of everything, rather than tending to the open wounds of a traumatized nation. However, there was one common view that most Colombians all seem to share at the end of La Violencia, a severe and undeniable distrust of the government. The end of La Violencia was the birth of the FARC guerrilla movement, which would continue to plague Colombia to this very day. More on this later. The trauma, hatred, and suspicion still rooted throughout society would have a profound impact on the generations born after La Violencia. Popeye was born in Yarumal, Colombia, on April 15, 1962, shortly after the end of La Violencia. The municipality of Yarumal is located in the department of Antioquia, roughly two and a half hours north of Medellin. It is a town with a dubious distinction. An unusually large number of its residents suffer from early-onset Alzheimer's disease. For the last 20 years, Yarumel has been the subject of numerous medical studies. Researchers believe this is a result of a genetic mutation brought over by a Spanish conquistador and passed throughout several generations. Lack of education, intermarriage, poverty, and poor health care have contributed to the amplification of this illness. In the early 1960s, Yarmel was mostly a rural community, consisting of farms and several small villages. Born John Jairo Velázquez Vázquez, the son of Servión Velázquez and Aura Ofelia Vázquez, he was one of five children. His father Servión was a small livestock farmer, while his mother Aura stayed at home to raise the children. She was an avid practitioner of the Catholic religion and wanted to raise her kids with an almost orthodox-like upbringing. She prayed with rosary beads each day with her children and insisted on the family attending church on a regular basis. Where there was limited education, religion filled the gap. When he was five years old, his father moved the family to Itagui, a small city located in the south of Medellin. Now, despite the fact that Itagui is a separate city, it's important to point out that it's located right next to Medellin. The proximity is that of Burbank to Los Angeles. Y nos vinimos del campo a la ciudad. Y la ciudad pues, transformó a mi padre, que era un campesino de buenas costumbres, y se convirtió en alcohólico. When we moved to the city, my father became an alcoholic, and my mother was a homemaker. But she was very strict and unhappy, which quickly made our home life unbearable. There was often physical abuse as punishment for any disobedience. We didn't have love or happiness in our family. We didn't celebrate birthdays, go on trips, or get presents for Christmas. All we did was work, school, and church. He attended a local Catholic school where he was constantly reprimanded by his teachers for causing mischief. This led to punishment at home carried out by his mother. 
By 1974, the population of Medellin had expanded significantly. The same was true for Itagui. And as the cities grew, so did crime. Violence was always one beat away. Shortly after his 12th birthday, John Jairo had returned home from school when he heard some unusual noise coming from the corner near his house. It was the sharp sound of metal scraping against metal. Curious, he walked down the corner to investigate. Much to his surprise, he came upon a violent fight between two men, each holding a machete. Instead of running away to safety, he retreated to a doorway nearby, providing him a clear view of the scuffle. The two men moved back and forth, each swing of their long blade. Suddenly, one of the men tripped and fell to the ground. The other quickly moved in and raised his machete, and in a swift motion, sliced open the fallen man's jugular, killing him immediately. The assailant fled the scene. John Jairo moved from the doorway to get a closer look. He stood transfixed at the dead man lying in a pool of his own blood. This was the first time he had ever witnessed a murder this close. He stared at the dead man for a little longer, and then calmly turned around and walked home. John Jairo didn't tell his parents about the incident. He chose to keep the story to himself. I want to point something out here. Colombia is an agriculture-based economy. Machetes are a common tool used on farms. Occasionally, they're used as weapons. The point being is that in Colombia, it's not uncommon to see two men fighting each other with machetes. Me danos por toda la violencia. My life was permeated by violence. I had friends who were killed in the streets. Every day, it was a fight just to stay alive. By the early 1970s, Colombia had emerged as a major supplier of narcotics to the U.S. It's important to point out at that time, the Colombians were primarily supplying Mexican dealers, who were in turn responsible for smuggling the drugs into the U.S. The main drug smuggled during this period was marijuana, particularly the famed Santa Marta Gold, also known as the Colombian Gold, or the Fine Colombian. If you're a fan of Steely Dan, you know what I'm talking about. This led to an increase in organized crime. Individual bandits began to form gangs or outfits. Neighborhoods were being claimed as territories. Tú ves una ciudad ahora llena de edificios. Esto es de cuenta del narcotráfico. With all the mafia money that came into the city, the mafia became a part of the DNA of Medellín. By his early teens, John Jairo had become fascinated with the mafia. Where his counterparts were interested in sports, particularly soccer, he was becoming obsessed with the big-shot gangsters in the neighborhood. As the cocaine trade in Medellín began to flourish, traffickers started flaunting their wealth. Cuando yo ya era un, un saliendo ya adolescente, Yo me paraba en el parque de Itagüí, un municipio acá de Medellín, a ver pasar a Fernando Galeano. As a boy, I was obsessed with the mafia and especially with Fernando Galeano. I would sit in the park near my home, Parque de Itagüí, in Medellín, and watch Galeano as he would flaunt his wealth and status in the park. He walked around with gorgeous beauty queens, rode expensive horses, and drove his Mercedes Benz around the park all the time. He always wore a lot of expensive jewelry. He built luxury buildings in the city. I would wait in the park all day and night, sometimes until three in the morning, just to wait for him to pass by. When I get home that late, my parents would be angry and often hit me for being late. Fernando Galeano Berrio was born around 1950 in Itagui. As a young man, Galeano entered the narcotics trade. He began his career as a supplier of marijuana and developed lucrative smuggling routes. Galeano then used his wealth to acquire real estate holdings, including several apartment buildings throughout Medellin. He gained a reputation as a shrewd businessman. By 1980, Galliano had moved successfully from marijuana smuggling to the more profitable cocaine trade. His ability to identify early on the rising demand for cocaine, combined with his smuggling instincts, made him into a successful narco-trafficker. Eventually, he became a member of the Medellin cartel and a trusted associate of Pablo Escobar. Pablo was the godfather to both of Galliano's children. Y a Fernando Galeano yo le cogí odio porque yo de niño era muy pobre y toqué el Mercedes con la mano y él me mandó a golpear. I was a very poor child and one time I was close to Galeano in his car. I reached out and touched his beautiful car. Galeano was furious. He had his men beat me in the park in front of everyone. After that I no longer looked up to Galeano and instead I had a lot of hatred for him. The beating by Galeano's bodyguards had a profound impact on John Jairo. Until that moment, 
the mafia had been his one escape from his increasingly difficult home life. Like most teenagers in Colombia at that time, John Jairo was yearning for a way out of poverty. Estuve de 15 años. Cuando a mí me mostraron en la televisión un barco de guerra para enrolarme en la marina en la escuela de suboficiales. When I was 15, I saw an advertisement for the Navy. They showed this beautiful warship and I decided to enlist in the Navy. After enlisting, John Jairo was sent to the Naval Academy in Barranquilla, a city located on the northern coast of Colombia, in the country's Atlantico Department. It's a 14-hour drive from Medellín. No había barcos de guerra, todo era mentiras. Eran barcos de madera viejos. When I arrived at the Naval Academy, I realized everything I had seen about the Navy was a lie. There were no warships like the advertisement has shown. Instead, they only had these dinky little wooden ships. I dropped out quickly, only staying for about a month. After his brief stint at the Naval Academy, John Jairo returned home. After I left the Navy, my neighbor saw me come home still wearing the uniform, and she gave me the nickname Popeye. Because I was a sailor. The nickname stuck. John Jairo was now Popeye. And he was back in Medellin. When I came back to Itagüí, I went back to high school. And at the same time, I began doing small jobs for the mafia. In Popeye's city of Itagüí, an increasing number of young men were joining criminal gangs, attracted by the allure of money and power. Porque yo... I was working for John Jairo Arias Tascón, alias Panina, who worked for Pablo Escobar. John Jairo Arias Tascón was just a year older than Popeye, but began his life of crime much earlier. Nicknamed Panina because of his high-pitched voice, he was a street kid who grew up in the slums of Medellín. Crime became his way of life. By the age of 12, he was a known thief. At 14, he had joined a gang and became a hitman by 15. Depending on who you speak to in Colombia, there are varying accounts of Panina's early life. The most compelling of those accounts occurred when he was 14. He stole a radio from a car parked at the San Pedro Cemetery. The owner of the vehicle was none other than Pablo Escobar. Instead of getting angry, Pablo was impressed at his ability to steal the radio. He dispatched an associate to find the thief. Panina was brought to Pablo, where the Don offered him work. Despite his age, Panina would become one of Pablo Escobar's most trusted lieutenants. Within the criminal world of Medellin, a transformation was taking place. A few years earlier, where fights had been fought with knives and machetes, were now being replaced with guns. Es como un edificio, tiene que empezar de abajo. Primero me permeó la violencia, vi muchos tiroteos. I witnessed shootings. I lost friends to violence, and at the same time, I developed this taste for weapons. Y le hacía trabajos pequeños. I started doing small jobs for the mafia. I kept an eye on someone who was going to be killed. I carried guns in my backpack and hid them in the school. I was learning the ins and outs of the mafia and taking my first steps to eventually joining. When I arrived, after high school, I decided to go to the National Police Academy in Bogota so I could become a police officer. I wanted to be an officer so that I could be a decent man instead of working for the mafia. In the academy, I was a very good cadet. In the 1970s, corruption in Colombia was a well-run enterprise. It was pervasive throughout all levels of government and the justice system. During that time, the government didn't work to root it out, but rather manage it. This is a byproduct of La Violencia. From the beat cops at the bottom of the chain collecting small payoffs, to the upper echelons of police chiefs and judges accepting huge bribes, the corruption had become systemic. Now, here's the crazy part. As the narcotics trade increased, even the Colombian military was hesitant to join in the fight against narco-trafficking. Not because they were afraid of a fight, but rather were worried about the temptations that would be placed in front of their forces. In a 1979 interview with the New York Times, Colonel Rafael Padilla Vergara of the Colombian Ministry of Defense said, Army commanders are displeased with the drug enforcement task. It's not something that we like because it exposes our officers and men to the danger of corruption. A lieutenant who seized two trucks with several tons of marijuana was offered a cash bribe of $100,000 on the spot. Throughout Colombia, contraband had become a way of life. Regardless of its form, 
To keep the contraband moving, the system's wheels needed to be greased. Those who chose not to participate found themselves in a precarious or dangerous predicament. This was clearly demonstrated in March of 1979 when the chief customs officer from the port city of Barranquilla, Rodrigo Rodriguez Pacheco, was violently murdered by machine gun toting sicarios in front of his home just as he was leaving to go to work. Corruption had literally saturated all major government institutions. Popeye would come to learn the police academy was no exception. Y un día el alférez que comandaba la compañía me dijo, oiga, John Jairo, usted es muy buen cadete, haga su curso con fuerza. The officer who was training us pulled me aside one day and told me that I was doing very well and if I continued to push myself and continued to do well in the academy, I could one day become a lieutenant. Que cuando usted sea un teniente, algún mafioso le regala un carro bien bonito. He told me that after I became a lieutenant, someone from the local mafia would approach me and give me an expensive car with the expectation that I'd be working for them. I knew then that I couldn't continue at a police academy because I didn't want to live a lie pretending I was an honest man while secretly working for the mafia. I didn't want to live with that duality, so I left the police academy. Inevitability, circumstances, external factors. There are numerous things that shape Popeye from early on. Many of these influences were out of his control. Poverty, parental abuse, education to name a few. However, Popeye's decision to leave the police academy marks a conscious shift in his path, a transition to the life of a criminal. Mira, eh, un criminal no se levanta de la cama y un día sale de la casa y empieza a matar, no. Es como un edificio, tiene que empezar de abajo. Nosotros no teníamos oportunidades... A criminal is not born, but made. When I was growing up, my family was very poor and there weren't a lot of options for me. If we wanted anything, we had to fight and sometimes kill to get it. I was also surrounded by violence and death. At the same time, I became fascinated with weapons and the mafia, especially people like Pablo Escobar. So all of these elements combined lead me to becoming a killer. Entonces me retiré, me retiré inmediatamente de la policía. Me retiré inmediatamente porque se podía no retirar inmediatamente. Y ahí es donde regreso a mi barrio, donde me aparece la oportunidad de escolta y de conductor. After I left the police academy, I came back to Medellín. I found work as a bodyguard because I had a permit for my gun at Smith and Wesson 38. I was working for the famous beauty queen Elsie Sofia as her driver and bodyguard. While I was working for Elsie Sofia, she became a mistress of Pablo Escobar. Since 1934, beauty pageants have become a Colombian obsession. Maria Victoria Uribe, the former Miss Bogota of 1968, who's written extensively about the subject, said, The beauty queens are a sort of oasis, an opiate of the masses, and the narco-traffickers are no exception. There is a long interconnected history of cartel players and beauty queens. For years, drug lords have sponsored throngs of contestants, taking on the form of a proxy war between rival cartels, Throughout his adult life, despite his marriage, Pablo Escobar had relationships with several beauty queens. A beauty queen in Colombia is not just a celebrity, but a status symbol. In his new job, Popeye drove Elsie everywhere. Her daily routine included trips to the hairdresser, gym, and shopping at exclusive boutiques throughout the El Poblado district of Medellin. Popeye adapted to his job with ease. Only a few days into the job, the beauty queen summoned Popeye to pick her up at home early one evening. Walking out the door wearing a low-cut stylish black dress, red high heels, and Cartier diamond necklace, Elsie slid into the back of the car. She gave Popeye an address to an upscale private home overlooking Medellin. They arrived at the house, where she instructed him to wait in the driveway. Roughly an hour later, three SUVs pulled up. Inside each car were several armed bodyguards. Popeye realized this was her rendezvous location. A stoutly man exited one of the vehicles. He was five foot six inches tall, with a crop mustache, hair parted to the side, dressed in a polo shirt tucked into his jeans and a pair of new Reebok sneakers. He slowly strode towards the house. Popeye stared ahead while glancing at the man from his driver's side mirror. The man was now approaching the car, almost like a cop at a traffic stop. He stopped, stared at Popeye, who had already rolled down the window. And who are you, the man asked. I am Popeye, Don Pablo. I am Miss Elsie Sofia's driver. The slightest of smiles came across Pablo's face. Popeye. Huh. 
He then turned and continued walking toward the house. This routine continued for the next few years. Eventually, Popeye became familiar with Pablo's security detail. He slowly gained their trust over time. It also helped that he was friends with Penina, who by this point had become Pablo's head of security. The numerous hours spent together waiting outside of various homes or apartments for their respective employers allowed them to bond while conversing on a range of topics. One of the topics that came up repeatedly was the talk of guns. Pablo loved guns. Popeye loved guns. All of Escobar's men had a virtual arsenal at their disposal. With money from his job, Popeye took the opportunity to restock. Las armas, eh, pistola, revolver. I love guns, and I had a lot of different kinds of guns. Pistols, handguns, machine guns. I even had a Thompson 45 like the one Al Capone had in the 1920s. Each rendezvous between Pablo and Elsie allowed Popeye more interaction with the Don. Like many of his extramarital affairs, Pablo grew tired of Elsie. His attention had turned to some other beautiful young women of Medellin. After one of Pablo's last visits to Elsie, Popeye was waiting outside of the house as usual, chatting casually with Pablo's bodyguards. The Don exited the house and approached him. Hey, Popeye, do you want to die with me? Pleased and excited, Popeye answered affirmatively, Patron, you are never going to die. If you're enjoying the podcast, please subscribe, rate, and review. Seriously, it helps. I hate bothering everybody for this, but I gotta do it. Please visit our website for a full list of credits and some cool bonus materials, like photos, videos, and declassified documents at thesicarioeffect.com. If you're not sure how to spell it, it's the name of the podcast. Or you can follow us on Instagram at thesicarioeffect, or on Twitter at sicarioeffect. There is no the in the handle. And on Facebook at Exclave Media. I'm Jonathan Branstein, your host and writer. The show is produced by me, Caitlin Tyrrell, Ernie Hurtado, and Matt Olson. Our editor is William Broughton. Our engineer, sound design, and mix, Ernie Hurtado. Co-producer, Esteban Orozco. Music composed by Preston Nowakowski. Artwork, Juan Felipe Orozco. Additional music is composed by William Broughton. Interview translator, Alejandro Caseno. Additional translation, Juliet Restrepo, Cristina Madrid. Production support was provided by Daniel Uria. Special thanks to Laura Kate Jones, Mauricio Builas, Alejandro Brugas, Alejandro Doring, Alexandra Doring, Tim Fufus, Tom Freston, Ross Bernard, Kelvin Wells II, Saad Moseni, Yoshi Obayashi, Jeff Frankel, Stephen Molina, and the fabulous Los Hermanos Orozco. Additional thanks to the Museo Casa de la Memoria in Medellin, the Ronald Reagan Presidential Library, the George Bush Presidential Library and Museum, Michael Pinckney, Mary Finch, Iafit Medellin, Luisa Garces. Also, please visit the Narco Tour Project at narcotour.co. That's narcotour.co. This podcast is dedicated to the memory of Guillermo Cano, Anthony Bourdain, and Larry Bresner.